Nancy Brown, I'm chair of the Environment APPG. We're doing this joint event with the uh, Woods and Trees APPG, chaired by Jason McCartney. And it's a delight to have uh, Zach Goldsmith here, who's the uh, Minister for Trees, or I think more formally, the uh, the Minister for Pacific and the uh, Environment. Uh, he's overseeing the uh, tree strategy. Um, consulted on uh, last year, uh, we had, uh, there's obviously a manifesto commitment to plant 30,000 hectares a year. Uh, the uh, consulted on it in June last year on the England tree strategy, had 20,000 responses. I'm going to publish the final uh, sort of conclusions uh, at some point. I know it's an issue close to many people's hearts, including uh, my own. Um, we also have uh, Barbara Young here, who is uh, Baroness Young, who many of you will know has uh, done many things in her past as chair of the Environment Agency and I think RSPB, uh, Chief Executive. Uh, she's um, the chair of the Woodland Trust as well. So get her views and then Jason from the APPG. We're obviously open to questions. Quite a few have submitted questions already. Uh, there are actually so many people here. I can't see you on all one screen, so don't uh, wave your hands all you can, but I can't guarantee I'll see you. Uh, it's better to put questions in the chat uh, and I'll pick those up uh, as we go along afterwards. Uh, we've got 45 minutes, so we need to keep it uh, relatively tight, but I'm just gonna hand over to Zach uh, for his thoughts on the, where are we with the tree strategy? Okay, th thanks very much. And, and you, you, you uh, described my position as being Minister for the Pacific and also trees. Um, and the majority of my portfolio is, is international, international conservation and run up to CBD and also as part of our efforts to put nature at the heart of the climate COP, which is where it absolutely belongs. So I'm going to, if you don't, I'm going to use a bit of the broad context because so many of the issues that we're talking about here in the UK are amplified around the world and vice versa. Um, so I, I think the first thing to say is that that even though as a consequence of COVID, we had to delay the climate COP and, and we know that the biodiversity COP, which is being hosted in Kunming, Kunming in China was also delayed. Um, clearly the crises that they exist to address have not been delayed or postponed in any sense. And I think COVID in, in many respects has actually thrown a sharper focus on these broader concerns, not just because coronavirus is itself likely the consequence of uh, misuse or abuse of, of nature, but because we know that that consequence is nothing, almost nothing compared to what we can expect if we continue to devastate the natural world and destabilize the climate. We know that if we allow trends to continue, we're going to pay a really terrible price. And there's no doubt that that's what we're doing. I, I could spend the next 45 minutes giving you examples. I won't, don't worry. But just to say in the last few months, we've heard that global uh, globally populations of of key species have declined by not far off 70% in my lifetime, which from an evolutionary point of view wouldn't qualify even as a blip. Uh, last year, we heard from Kew Gardens um, that two fifths of the world's plants are facing extinction, which is twice what we thought was a problem when they reported four years before. And I think most shocking of all, and perhaps most relevant to this APPG, we're losing uh, on average around 30 football pitches worth of forest every single minute. And in fact, that's last year's figure this year. It, uh, sorry, that's 2008, uh, 2019, uh, 2020 looks to have been worse, but we haven't had all those figures verified yet. Um, and the thing is, I think, you know, we hear these figures so often. I mean, I've been working on these issues all my life. I know Barbara, who's going to be speaking late, lately, uh, later, has also been campaigning on these issues all her life. And you can, I think, get um, become used to them. You can become immune to these figures. Um, they, they, who is it? Stalin, who said, you know, a, a, a death is a tragedy, a million deaths is a statistic or something to that effect. And I think the same is probably true in the way we react to some of these figures. So I saw something recently, which I found particularly striking. And that is, if you condense, the earth is 4.6 billion years old. If you scale that back to one year, humans have been around for less than an hour. Our industrial revolution began much less than one minute ago. And in under one second, we've destroyed more than half of the world's tropical forest. And it goes without saying that another second like that and it's game over, not just for the 80% of the world's terrestrial biodiversity that lives in forests or the billion people who depend for their livelihoods on those forests, but for all of us, every one of us depends on forests, whether we know it or not, for air to breathe, food, resources, trade, medicines, functioning weather and water systems. And to make matters worse, deforestation and land use are now the second biggest contributor to climate change. We've got this appalling vicious cycle here. And finally, it is worth saying that when ecosystems fail 
as we're seeing around the world, so too do the numerous free and hopelessly undervalued services that nature provides. And it's those people who depend most directly on those services who are hit hardest. Now, you know, there are plenty of middle men and women between us and nature on this call, but there are plenty of people who depend directly on nature. And when nature fails, so too do their livelihoods. So turning this around, this trajectory, I, clearly, objectively, is the biggest challenge that we face. I, I'm not gonna dwell on the pandemic other than to say that, there, that it has created a, a pause. It has created, I think, an opportunity as well. The, the, we're perhaps not meant to say that, but the, the reality is that every economy in the world has been shattered, even those countries and particularly small island states that have somehow managed to avoid the virus they've still been battered economically and we're going to have to rebuild everyone's going to have to rebuild trillions of dollars have been put aside for that job and so we can choose to invest that money in a different way we can choose to invest as if there is such a thing as the future as if nature matters um, and I, I, I think the UK can be proud of having kind of put a stake in the ground on that territory, on that issue. I think the UK is genuinely providing real leadership internationally. First country to legislate for net zero, obviously precedes the pandemic. They're running the Global Ocean Alliance. Now nearly 60 countries have signed up to the general commitment that 30% of the world's ocean should be protected by the end of this decade. We're co-chairing the High Ambition Coalition of Countries, which is for 30% of the world land to be protected by the end of this decade. Our blue belt of marine protected areas is staggering. One of the greatest conservation stories of all time, an area uh, bigger than India, protected, fully protected around the world, some of the great biodiversity hotspots. We've doubled our international climate finance even despite the pushback or the, the squeeze into to the ODA budget. Yesterday, the Prime Minister announced that uh, around a third, or the, the figure he used was three billion pounds of that, will be spent on nature-based solutions. On the back of that, we hope France, uh, Holland, uh, Norway, Canada will align their policies with ours. That means massive more money going into nature-based solutions for climate change, etc. But all of our international leadership hinges on our, the authority that we will have by doing the right thing here at home. And, and therefore, our, what we do in this country matters so much. And the case for action here is, is, is clear. I mean, the decline that I've just described globally is more than reflected here in the UK. Last year's State of Nature Review found that 41% of UK species are declining. We're seeing an increasing intensity of flood damage caused in part by poor land use, bad land use decisions. Uh, and we know that meeting our net zero emissions will require huge heavy lifting on a scale that we've never seen before. So we've got our work cut out and a big part of the solution is trees. Because in addition to providing beauty and joy uh, to, in our lives, trees are the solution to so many problems. The hideous term used by some economists and solution multipliers, that is trees. Trees are solution multipliers. They're one solution which addresses so many different problems. And planting trees can prevent a repeat of the recent horrors we saw with flooding last year, turning countless lives up, we know, upside down. We know that planted in the right places, uh, trees improve the ability of the land to absorb and hold water during the wetter seasons, but also to hold it for longer during the drier seasons as well. We know that land restoration is critical if we're going to reverse the appalling collapse of biodiversity we've seen in recent dec decades. Trees are a big part of that. And we know there's no pathway to net zero. It's simply not possible to get to net zero here or indeed around the world that does not involve massive efforts to protect and restore nature and that's why on the back of the advice by the climate change committee we committed in our manifesto to planting 30,000 hectares of trees uh, per year by 2025 and I know there are those and I'm sure some on this call who will say that that's not enough and, and perhaps they're right but it nevertheless requires doing things at a rate and scale that we have never done them before it requires us a step change in the way we're doing things but I think everyone is to everyone. I think there are huge numbers of people who are absolutely up for the challenge, wanting to be part of this solution. Uh, as you said uh, earlier, we got 20,000 responses to our, ET, our, our, our consultation on the England tree strategy. We have the tools we need to accelerate our ambition for trees. We've got a new £640 million Nature for Climate Fund. We've got a new £50 million woodland, guarantee, uh, woodland Carbon Guarantee Scheme. And I think the biggest opportunity of all which is slightly harder to define because we're still working through it, but the biggest opportunity of all is a transition away from the damaging EU uh, land subsidy system, which effectively paid people for transforming their land to make it farmable, 
and, and that meant grubbing out a lot of very valuable ecosystems towards a new system where payments are conditional upon good environmental outcomes. So uh, through the Environment Bill, we're legislating, as you know, for biodiversity net gain. I think it's a world first. It requires all new developments to add at least 10% to existing biodiversity. And of course, trees are going to be a big part of that. Uh, a new 12 million pound fund announced a few weeks ago will plant over 500 hectares of trees in 10 community forests from Yorkshire to Somerset, creating jobs across the country. Uh, if and when I should say that works, we will be rolling that out still further. Uh, there are some 68 projects supported by our uh, 40 million pound green recovery challenge fund um, and that will see over 800,000 trees planted giving our rural economy a boost restoring moorlands wetlands forests and providing jobs as well and one of the projects we're supporting will plant 10,000 trees close to more than 50 NHS sites to help patients recover and even receive treatment outside um, in the future which is a phenomenal idea uh, a second round of the fund's going to open early this year but it's not all about actively planting trees. Uh, I'm going to wrap up very quick because I realise I'm eating into our time. But it's not all about actively planting trees. We need to look after our existing native woodlands, in particular our ancient woodlands, so veteran trees that have seen centuries pass can stand and watch future generations to come. And I think almost most excitingly, we want to unleash the extraordinary power of natural regeneration as well. Anyone who's seen the magic of NEP will know why that matters and, and what scope there is for something really extraordinary to happen. So as part of that, we're developing a, an ambitious new program to regenerate lands all the way alongside our watercourses. And I, I, this is a project which is very, very early days, but I'm, I've, I'm, I'm accelerating things because I think it is one of the most exciting things we can do. And that is to look for opportunities to work with landowners, uh, and in some cases the public sector, to rewild or plant but effectively return to nature, land either side of all of the waterways across the country. And that would create extraordinary nature network, nature corridors. It would help in relation to cleaning pollution out of the water, slowing down the flow of water. And of course, water areas tend to be packed with life. So there's so many reasons why we want to do that. And I think that could be one of our flagship projects. I certainly hope so. And we're working very hard on that with lots of great people outside of government. And finally, we want everyone to be part of the of planting the Queen's Green Canopy across the UK to mark the platinum Jubilee. And I, I do feel that, you know, at a time when all our institutions have got great big question marks over them and trust in those institutions is pretty much gone. The one thing that's standing that everyone loves is the monarchy. Well, I say everyone. I'm sure there are people on this call who would disagree. But on the whole, there was a great outpouring of respect and love for Her Majesty. And I feel that, that the Queen's green canopy has the capacity to really capture people's imagination. And the last one I wanted to make, we've seen real movement in relation to low carbon, uh, the low carbon revolution. Um, the cost of renewables has collapsed apps pretty much zero emissions vehicles on the cusp of going mainstream whatever happens with politicians the market is heading pretty rapidly in an obvious direction we saw that under trump where cold use collapsed faster under his watch than it did under obama despite huge subsidies he poured into trying to prop up the sector so i'm not suggesting we should be complacent about that clearly there's things government can do to ramp things up and that's our job as the president of cop but when it comes to nature and attaching a value to nature or attaching a cost to its destruction we have barely made a dent uh, and that has to change because low carbon technology great though it is is not going to save the day alone there is no part pathway to tackling climate change, or indeed protecting lives and livelihoods, reversing biodiversity loss, etc., that does not involve protecting and conserving nature on an unprecedented scale. Nature-based solutions we think could provide around a third of the solution to climate change, the most cost-effective solutions to climate change. They get about two and a half percent of the world's finance when it comes to climate finance. That makes no sense, and it's why yesterday's announcement by the Prime Minister was so important. So we are asking countries to step up in the run-up to COP. We want them to align their policies as much as possible with what we're doing here in the UK. Uh, we are are trying to create a global alliance of countries committed to switching land use subsidy systems as we're doing here. We're building an alliance of countries committed to cleaning up supply chains and removing deforestation from supply chains, soya and palm oil and cocoa and the works. Um, and we are, um, and I am very much out of time. So I just want to make, I'm going to stop there. I, I, I could, I, I'm going to stop there because I think so I've that, said enough for a good discussion. Um, so you know, your passion and uh, uh, insight as well built up over your uh, career and environment. Um, I can come to Barbara Young now, just as a response to Chair of the Woodland Trust. What, what would you like to see in the chief strategy and any particular sort of comments on what uh, Lord Goldsmith just said? Well, I think... I mean, yeah, again, if you could keep it brief, because we've only got 45 minutes total. I think Zach has laid out very clearly just how important woods and trees are. 
I'm not sure I'm going to adopt solutions multipliers. I like to think that if we didn't have woods and trees, we'd have to invent them because they're the sort of omnipurpose tool delivering uh, climate change, biodiversity, human health improvements, flood risk management, all of the list that he's already talked about both globally and, and uh, nationally. And we are looking forward very much at the Woodland Trust to the England Tree Strategy uh, bearing that out. Um, for us, uh, it's got to be about carbon, but it's also got to be about biodiversity. Uh, and I think we've got to make sure that we don't end up with some sort of artificial schism between commercial forestry and amenity and conservation forestry. They are different, but and we do need both, but they both need to work for both climate change and for, for biodiversity. Uh, the, the, the statistic that has staggered me all the way through the COVID crisis is how the public's commitment to woods and trees has stayed universally high all the way through. Uh, it's really encouraging that people have recognised the benefits of having woods and trees close to them uh, and also the benefits for, uh, for climate change and carbon. So that, that's, that's really good. We were delighted, of course, in the, the uh, election when the, the manifestos started sprouting trees across all political parties. It was like an arms war. It was great. Um, um, but that highlights one thing we do need from the England tree strategy, and that is it, it can't just be an England tree strategy. It's, it's got to be uh, four nations. It's got to be all government departments. Uh, uh, and uh, we really do need to make sure that, that everybody's pushing at the same targets, which are then enshrined in things like the Environment Bill uh, and are properly resourced. So um, we've got to make sure that we're not just tree planting trees for trees sake, it's got to be trees that are delivering these multi multifunctional outcomes uh, and making sure we get a, a big bangs for our bucks, multi-purpose bangs for our bucks. Um, I was glad that Zach talked about two other issues. One is management. It's clear that we haven't got a system at the moment for rewarding people for management of native broadleaf woodland in a particularly effective way. We can do a lot through agroforestry and uh, changes in the agriculture system, but I think we do need to look at the whole broadleaf market in this country and see how people can be uh, supported in managing native broadleaf. Um, and of course, the whole question of not um, forgetting about ancient woodland and veteran trees. Um, I do worry that um, MHCLG have kind of lost sight of that in their planning reforms. Uh, and it would be a complete travesty if our most important woodland for some of these multifunctional purposes, i.e. ancient woodland was uh, getting less good protection than it had uh, in our push for planting for new new uh, new trees everywhere. So those are the sorts of things we want to see from the uh, England tree strategy, but mostly we'd like it soon. Indeed, I think I'm sure we all would. Um, and uh, just coming uh, to Jason before we come to the questions, I should say lots of questions have been coming through. We've got far more than we can uh, possibly come to in the time, so I'll have to be slightly selective. But Jason, as a chair of the APPG on woods and trees, what would you like to see in the tree strategy? Uh, thanks, Anthony. Just to remind everyone, this is a joint uh, APPG meeting between the Environment APPG and the APPG for Woods and Trees. So I'm Jason McCartney. I'm um, in West Yorkshire. I got involved with this all party group because I'm very passionate about the northern forests. So I've got some of the Pennine Valleys just heading up to the Pennine Hills before we head over onto the dark side and uh, Lancashire. Um, I'm very passionate about the northern forest. We have around 13 million people here, but only around 7% uh, of the tree cover uh, acro across the nation. So we really do need this northern forest. I know the Woodland Trust are committed to over uh, 50 million trees. Uh, for me, it's about connecting with nature. It's about air quality. It's about uh, flood prevention. Uh, and these are all things that are impacting on our communities day in and day out. And the engagement here is just incredible. I've just been looking this morning on the website of a fantastic group that's been going for 50 years, the Con Valley Tree Society. Uh, and they've planted over a quarter of a million trees. And the volunteers were out over Christmas in the snow, uh, planting oak and cherry uh, and rowan and Scots pine trees uh, of all ages as well. It just engages with uh, every aspect, every age group of the community. Uh, and that's what I want to see us build on with support from the government. And it was wonderful uh, to hear from the minister. Uh, I'm just gonna bring in the first, uh, kick off the questions actually, 
And as I am chair of the all-party group for Woods and Trees, I'm going to be a little bit self-indulgent, Anthony, uh, by inviting Darren Moorcroft, who's the CEO of the Woodland Trust, uh, to ask the first question, if he can. And then I'll hand back to you, Anthony, to go through the question, as if I may. Absolutely fine. Darren. Thank you, Jason. And thank you, Anthony. And thank you, Minister. Um, from what you, what's been said, we, what we know is if we do it right, trees and woods will help us to deliver nature and climate together. So, uh, but so far the debate is understandably focused on increasing tree cover and that success will depend on us not just planting millions of new saplings, but as has been mentioned, establishing, maintaining and protecting new and existing trees and woods across uh, and over decades. Uh, so, but we don't start from a great starting position because as uh, the minister said, many stats don't paint us in a very good light. 10% of our native woodland here is not in favorable uh, ecological condition and the remaining fragments of irreplaceable woodland, ancient woodland, continues to be lost. So what I quite like from the Minister is a commitment as to what policy targets and resources are needed to play a full part in tackling the nature and climate crisis from the England Tree Strategy and particularly I think binding targets. What can we expect to see and will they address condition and not just quantity? because that I think is crucial to do both. Yeah, thanks very much. So I'm gonna try and be quick with my answers so we can get as many in as possible. The answer is that, look, we're, we're currently looking at whether or not through the um, target setting process, uh, which is proposed in the Environment Bill, whether or not there is a case for a statutory target for trees. At the moment, we're governed by the commitment that we made in the manifesto, which is followed through into policy, which is 30,000 hectares a year by 2025. And the reason I'm a bit vague about that is because I, the, the, the setting of the 30,000 hectare target was based quite into, to, to a large degree on the way things have been done. Yes, on a different scale. Yes, much more than before, but the same sort of approach where you look at some land and say that lends itself to planting. And then you look at other land and say that doesn't. So peat, peat lands, for example, don't often lend themselves, certainly deep peat lands don't lend themselves to being planted with trees. But there's a lot of gray area as well of land which maybe doesn't lend itself to planting in a sort of more conventional formal sense, but which nevertheless could massively benefit from something along the rewilding spectrum or natural colonization or assisted planting. There's a, there's a lot of land out there which, which can be massively improved from a, the point of view of biodiversity and of course carbon and water management but without necessarily having to be formally planted. So I, I think I, look, my, my commitment is, it, our, our formal commitment is the 30,000 hectare a year by 2025. My commitment is that I will push as hard as I possibly can to go as far as we possibly can and to increase that number as much as we can. But there will be no point in me making a promise now because I just don't know how far we're gonna be able to go. I hope that answers the question. Thank you very much. Um, got another question now from uh, Philip Dunn, uh, MP, Chair of the Environment Audit Committee. Has a practical question about the bureaucracy around it. Philip, I don't know if you can ask your question directly. I can't see you on the uh, screen. I'll, I'll try. Okay. Can you hear me, Anthony? Yeah, we can. Perfect. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for arranging this, both you and Jason, and for uh, Zach, for your enthusiasm, which is very evident from your presentation. Um, I have some practical questions about implementation of policy and the challenges that we have, you have as the minister responsible for, um, for, for delivering this policy through agency. So I have a, an email from a constituent last week who has a 50 acre area of, uh, of land in Shropshire, which he's trying to plant or tried to plant into woodland this autumn. He had to go through entirely duplicative processes through both the RPA and the Forestry Authority, which took so many months that he missed the planting season this autumn uh, and contrasted that with the experience in Scotland, where he also has some land and succeeded in getting it done within two months. The consequence of um, unjoined up uh, bureaucracy at the moment means that you're going to miss out on achieving your targets in these early years unless you can bring coherence to the application process. Yeah, thank you very much indeed for that. And, and without wanting to shirk the question, I'd love to know more about that afterwards, more specifically what happened there. And if you could put me in touch with your constituent, 
that would be very, very helpful indeed. Um, look, I'm very aware, and you know, you're not clearly your constituents, not the first person to raise the issue of the sort of bureau, the bureaucratic holdup. The Forestry Commission has has responded, so they've just launched um, just uh, two months ago launched improvements to the woodland creation planning grant, uh, reduction to the minimum application block size. They say that they've streamlined parts of the process to remove duplication uh, and, uh, and un what they've described as unnecessary regulatory processes. Um, the tree strategy is going to be out outlining further steps we can take to simplify the process. We know the process can be massively simplified. We have to simplify the process. We need to make it as easy as possible to engage. So the more examples that I or anyone else on this call can, can bring to my specific examples, you can show me of where uh, is, you know, dumb-headed bureaucracy has prevented progress. That's the kind of stuff that I need to see. I'm absolutely determined that we make it as attractive and easy as possible. And I'd also like feedback at some point on whether or not the, the Forestry Commission's, the, the work that they've done has actually led to the improvements that appear to be the case on paper, but obviously it's in practice, it'd be useful to know whether or not that's the case. Thank, Thank you. you. We'll come to uh, Lord Carrington next, who uh, pre-submitted a question, which I know is a very topical for my constituency as a farming constituency, a very valuable farmland. Um, Lord Carrington, I don't know if you want to ask the question or shall I read it out so I can see you there? My question is that uh, in order to grow decent trees, which both benefit uh, the uh, carbon capture side and end up with a decent market value for the uh, farmer, you need to, pl to plant them on decent land. And uh, at the moment, most people are talking about planting trees on marginal land, and that simply isn't going to be good enough. Now, in order to get farmers and landowners to plant on good land, you are going to have to pay them in a way that is comparable to their payment through growing first wheat uh, and, and in terms of providing a decent uh, gross margin and net margin, as they won't certainly wait for 150 years or whatever in order to get their return. Thank you. I mean, so, so ultimately, this is going to be about incentives. At the moment, as as uh, Anthony mentioned earlier, oh, sorry, as Bernice Young mentioned, um, the market is not there um, for mass tree planting, uh, whether broadleaf or even conventional forestry, um, conifers and, and the like. Uh, so ultimately, this is about the government setting the right incentives. And there is a balance to be struck there. To, we want to buy as much solution as we can with the public money that we're spending. And necessarily that does mean incentivizing people to plant land where they're not going to be earning uh, significant profits uh, through other activities. Um, and it doesn't mean that all trees are going to be planted on marginal lands, but, but equally that is going to be where most of the respondents to the stimuli provided by government are going to want to plant their trees. And I think there is an argument against using uh, uh, excessive amounts of good quality farmland for tree production. There is a value in this country being able to produce a certain amount of food. It's an issue that comes up over and over again. And I think it has also been put into focus by COVID where supply chains suddenly had a great big question mark over them. So I, I, I do take your point. You will have better quality trees growing on good quality farmland, but that comes at a cost. And it, it, it remains the case that there is enormous value beyond just the commercial sector in planting trees on the more marginal land. I mean, what is the value of slowing down surface water or holding water for longer periods during the dry season? There is a, it's hard to quantify, but there is a value there. What's the value in beginning to turn the tide on the biodiversity crisis that we've been experiencing in this country now for, for many decades? it also has a value, not necessarily one you can put a number on, but there's a value there. So I I, um, I, I do, I note the point you've made, um, Lord Carrington, but I I think we have to, we have to make it, take advantage of the opportunities that actually exist. And, and I think many of those opportunities are gonna be by either rewilding or formally planting on some of that marginal land. In fact, a lot of that marginal land. Okay, thank you. Then one of the pre-submitted questions from Guy Shrubshall, I hope I pronounced that right, uh, from Friends of the Earth. And then I'll come to Richard Fuller, who asked a, uh, a question, and then uh, Earl Caithness. So Guy uh, Shrubshall, Friends of the Earth. Thank you very much, Anthony. Yes, um, uh, I'd just like to ask uh, you, Lord Godsmith, um, whether you had any comment on the new parliamentary post note that has been published today on woodland creation, uh, which states that the UK government is off track in meeting its manifesto pledge to uh, establish 30,000 hectares of trees per year by 2025, because 
it breaks down the figures, uh, the commitments that have been made so far by each devolved nation, uh, and also looks at treasury funding that's been announced for trees in England. And that looks like there's only around 26,000, maybe 27,000 hectares of trees that will be planted um, per year by 2025. And I just wondered if, if um, there were any additional measures the government would be announcing to be able to make up that shortfall uh, towards the manifesto commitment. It's, it's very close, but I agree it's not quite 30,000, obviously. Exactly. Um, so look, the, the reality is that we are we are off track uh, and, and it would be pointless pretending otherwise, but, but that is the purpose of the initiatives that have been brought forward or that are coming forward. So the England tree strategy is going to set the, the framework for delivering on that manifesto commitment that, that has not yet been published. Um, there, I, I, I can sense a sigh, a sigh and a groan from many people on the call, but we've got to get it right. We've had huge feedback. There are things that, that ministers are also trying to do to improve it. Um, we want to get this is a generational opportunity, um, but, but that is why we need an England tree strategy. And when it comes to funding, I mean, yes, if you measure purely the existing funds, which are labeled tree funds, so the Nature for Climate Fund, for example, um, there's not going to be enough money there. But if you start adding to that the rad revolutionary changes that are happening to our land use subsidy system, which I described earlier, if you also add to that the fact that there are other well-funded strategies, the, the uh, you know flood strategy, for example, which my colleague Rebecca Powell is in charge of, billion pound budgets, where we know that a big part of the solution, if we want to minimize the risk of floods going forward, will be nature-based solutions. And usually that means trees. So in the round, I think, the, I think it is the case that we have the resources we need. Um, we certainly have the ambition and the tree strategy will tell us how to deliver. Um, and it'll find, last point on that, which I, I think someone else I saw in the chat was, was asking around the sort of private sector. We, we also need to try and mobilize private finance. Um, and it's a, I'm not going to try and answer that question now unless someone asks me the question because it's big. Neil it's Harwood, big. who was asking us about the involvement okay. of so, yeah. but, but all in, I, you know, the, the, we can deliver. It's going to require a huge amount of heavy lifting, but we can deliver. Um, but that doesn't mean doing things the way we have been doing until now. It means doing things differently. So we're going to come to Richard Fuller and then uh, Earl of Caithness. Uh, thanks, Anthony. Zach, that was a wonderful uh, presentation of the energy, as many have said, is just, just great um, and the expansiveness of it. So thank you very much. And, you know, the tree strategy has the chance. I'm sometimes worried about the divisions that can be caused as we move forward, so the cost allocations and net zero as we start to try and achieve those goals and public money for public goods and how that works between rural areas and, and environmental goals. Trees seem to be something that potentially combined us all together. And I was I was wondering, you're talking a little bit about the private sector, I wonder about the retail offer. So you know, when I was young, we had plant a tree in 73. Uh, is there a sort of an updated version where you can really galvanize people like you know, my three words where people can pay for different parts where they can start to move money around so that overall, it helps provide some oil to achieve your objectives. It's a really good idea. Plant a tree in 73, plant some more in 74. And there was another one, but I can't remember what it was. Um, plant you, five in 75, why not? <laughs> Um, the so minor strike took the <laughs> minor strike took over there. But any ideas, by the way, please send them in. But yeah, look, we do. We need to. We need to somehow uh, capture that. Not, I was going to say that same sense of enthusiasm, uh, but actually much more than that. And we've got everything going for us at the moment. We're, you know, hosting COP. The, the awareness around the problems of climate change and biodiversity loss are really so much more mainstream than they were even two or three years ago. Um, if we can't tap into that now and mobilize people to the extent that the whole country takes a, a, takes ownership of this endeavor, then we'll never be able to. And I'm absolutely convinced we can. We are working on this. I can't present you a, a beautiful plant a tree in 73 comms plan yet, um, but we are working very hard on this. And, and as I said, we're very open to ideas and I'm, I'm convinced that, that we can do it. And I mentioned, I think I mentioned in my opening remarks, if I didn't, I meant to mention that we have the Queen's Canada as well, the, um, uh, which provides an opportunity for us to extend even further, to extend our reach even further than we otherwise would be able to. Um, and we know that working with the palace and uh, you know, endless public bodies, we ought to be able to do that. Excellent. And uh, Malcolm Kaithas, you had a question? Uh, thanks, Anthony. Uh, I'm concerned that, that Jack is, Zach is, is, is focusing far too much on marginal land, not enough on good land. We are the second largest net importer of timber in the world, which is an appalling uh, situation for the country that grows the best, has the best climate for growing timber anywhere in the world. And unless we grow commercial timber, change the Forestry Commission's attitude, change and train our people, not only just to plant, but to manage timber, 
all we're going to produce is scrub timber. Great, quite good for carbon, quite good for biodiversity, but not good for the environment overall. Yeah, uh, thank you for that. And I and I, I apologize then if I've given the wrong impression. I, I'm, you're right, though. I did. I was emphasizing the use of public money to incentivize planting on uh, some of those marginal lands and either side of the waterways and so on. But it's not all about public money. So th currently there is no formal market for the kind of tree planting that, that, that I was describing. And therefore the case for public intervention and use of public money is very strong. You know, the environmental problems tend to con be a consequence of mar broader market failure. There is a market, albeit an uncertain one, but there is a market for the more commercial planting that you've just described. And the, what we're trying to do, and this will again be clear in the England tree strategy, was trying to figure out what can government, not just DEFRA, but other departments as well do to provide more certainty for that market and to add more value to that market. Market without necessarily always turning to the to, to public subsidy. So, for example, you know, the the, uh, the if you look at the amount of timber that's used in new new build here in England and compare it with any other country in Europe, we're miles behind. So, why not stimulate that? Stimulate that. I've been talking to colleagues in MHCLG um, to see whether they're up for looking at the regulatory system, whether they're looking, whether they're up for looking at incentives to increase the use of timber. Not, obviously, not in skyscrapers, but in, in in homes and even relatively tall buildings. And they are up for that. And there are things like that that we can do, which would immediately add value to the, to, to the sector without necessarily dipping into the public person. The, the reality is that, you know, I, I said to Guy earlier, that I think it was Guy, that we have we have the dosh we need, but, but actually, you know, we have to make every penny work as hard as possible. Um, and if we can do things without the use of public money, then we should do. But you're right, we are mass, we, massive net importers. We need to try and redress that balance. And one of the ways we can do that is by working Working with other departments of government to add value to the sector and, and we know that can be done because other countries have done it. it doesn't require us to be particularly original just to look at who's getting it right and France for example is ahead of us on this in my view. Thank you uh, and then there's lots of questions coming in I'll try and do as many as possible we've only got uh, less than 10 minutes left so um, Alison Fullfoot had, uh, um, has been asking questions Alison I don't know if you're here if you could say which organization you're from as well or where you're from. Hello can you hear me? We can, yeah. Oh, great. Um, yeah, so I work for National Grid and obviously as a large infrastructure company, I was just interested to hear the views around protections to existing woodlands, recognising that, you know, any woodland that is removed, if it's mature and ancient, it's, you know, it's not a like for like replacement if you plant new woodland um, in its place. So it would be good to get views on protection of existing woodlands as part of the strategy. Yeah, OK, thank you. And actually, uh, and Barbara Young mentioned the same point. Um, but we we um we we strengthened um, planning protections for ancient woodlands in the um, national planning policy framework, um, and in addition to that, the environment bill that's going through at the moment will, if it goes ends up as it currently looks, which I'm sure it will, uh, will require local authorities to consult before engaging in tree felling or even removal of individual urban trees, um, not just urban trees, but but from the individual tree to the to the larger woodland. Um, the England tree strategy is going to be outlining further protections. So I, what I should have said in response to what Barbara raised earlier, there is a concern that the planning, the, the thrust of planning uh, uh, law evolution in this country is, is kind of against the grain uh, of the discussion we're having at the moment, but that is not reflected in government decisions. We, we are absolutely determined not just to plant, but to protect, to properly manage and to nurture what we already have. And we know that that is a prerequisite to getting where we need to get to. So I, I hope by the end of this process, by the end of the Environment Bill, as the England tree strategy emerges, we you will be reassured that we're, we are very serious about protecting what we have. Okay. I think I'm going to come to one last question from uh, Lord Lucas, who had a very interesting question about the number of species that we hadn't uh, touched on uh, so far. And then I'm just going to come to Barbara Young for name comments and uh, uh, and Jason McCartney and then and then Zach and then we'd wrap up. So Lord Lucas, you have your question or do you want me to ask it? Uh, I might as well ask it since. Uh, yeah, excellent. Uh, Zach, a, a, a really Keep it good... short, we're very tight for time. Yeah. Yeah. A good temperate tree ecosystem has about a thousand species in it. Europe's reduced to 300. We've only got 30. Uh, surely we need to do something to increase biodiversity or we'll just get flattened by one plague after another. It is a hugely important point. I mean, that biodiversity is obviously, uh, biodiversity loss is 
evident and accepted. We know we know what's happening. Biodiversity um, is at the heart of the England tree strategy. Um, I'm absolutely convinced that as we spend public money and change the rules where necessary, we do so with a view to reversing these trends that we're seeing uh, that we've seen for the last few decades. So I, on, on principle, I absolutely agree with you. Um, about the importance of biodiversity. The, the, I don't know whether your question is also, it, whether you're suggesting that we should be looking to um, import diversity in order to expand from that base of 30. And that is a more complicated question. I and mean, as you'll know, there's big debates raging at the moment in relation to trying to repopulate species that were recently extinct, the beavers, for example, and, and others. Um, and, and I'm in, in, an enthusiast um, within reason. Um, and I think there's masses of scope there. In relation to plant varieties, I would be speaking from a position of ignorance if I were to pontificate now on, on what the opportunities are. Um, but I'm sure there are opportunities and I'm sure the case could be made for trying to gradually and slowly grow the diverse, the biodiverse base of our tree stock here in this country. But it would have to be done incredibly carefully and with a lot of scientific backing. I don't know if that's the question you're asking, but I, I think so. Yeah, that's fair, that's, that, that's fair enough, but it's a, uh, uh, it's just illustrated by the rate at which our trees are getting knocked over. That actually, yeah. our problem is we've got too too few of them, and and, uh, and there's a and there's a and, whole and the, and the genotypes are too narrow. I, I completely agree with that. And there's a whole bunch of tree diseases just waiting to jump the channel, um, which we look at with dread. And and I do think that we've I don't think we've taken advantage of the fact that we are an island. I think in our you know there's it. I personally would not. I'm straying from government brief here, but I, the idea that you can safely import a mature tree with a gigantic root ball full of organisms that we haven't even begun to understand when we can perfectly well produce those trees here it seems to me to be reckless and unjustifiable. So I'd like us to be doing more in that space. I know my view is shared actually by John Gardner, who's the Minister for Biosecurity, um, uh, but I think we could be doing more to take advantage of the natural elements. Okay, and then um, just coming to Barbara Young for any sort of final thoughts or comments and then Jason and then uh... Uh, wrap up. Barbara. Andy. Thanks, Anthony. Um, I think what we've seen today is the huge commitment that exists right across the whole of the sectors for planting more woods and trees. Um, mm. And so the England tree strategy has really got to be the means of delivering that. Um, the um, I, I would like to see government nailing its colours to the mast and putting clear targets for, for woodland creation into the environment uh, bill, so that there's a statutory basis. But I'd also like to see um, uh, also the um, a statutory basis for the protection of ancient woodlands. So there's a challenge to Zach. Let's have statutory target and statutory protection for ancient woodland, and that will really be the government nailing its colours to the mast. I'll do what I can. And Jason, do you want to wrap up? Yeah, thanks, uh, Minister, for your time this afternoon. Really appreciate it. Your, your passion and knowledge has really come through. Um, as I said, this is a, a joint meeting of the two all-party groups. On behalf of the all-party group for Woods and Trees, uh, we will be letting you know about future meetings coming up. We're trying to get a meeting with Chris Pincher, the Planning Minister, uh, to talk about the planning reforms and uh, tree cover for new developments, high streets. Um, really, really important issue. So look out for that and we'll get those invites uh, out in your inboxes, hopefully not too far away. But Anthony, thank you for your APPG joining up on this one. Yep. And uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Zach, for your time. And uh, we've got, had incredible interest here. Over 70 people turning up shows how much interest there is in trees. And I'm sure we will come back to it with another joint event and you can lead chair it next time, Jason. Uh, but maybe when you've uh, published your tree strategy, Zach, I don't know if you want to say any very, very last thoughts or... Um, one last one, so I don't want to be repetitive, but actually prompted by the, the point that, that Jason just made. And that is that, you know, DEFRA is the lead organisation on this, but it requires all, all of government to be involved. Obviously the cash comes from the treasury, there are regulatory things that can be done by MHCLG. But the other area that I should have mentioned is that there's a huge amount of land that's owned by government, by different departments. And yes, the certain land lends itself to development to help deal with the housing uh, pressures that we face in this country, but there's a lot of land there which could be put into this endeavor. Um, so I would simply say that as you talk to other ministers from other departments, make that point every now and again, it would be very helpful. 
Okay. Thank you very much. That, that's great. Thank you very much, uh, Lord Goldsmith. Thank you, Barbara Young, Jason, and everyone else for turning up. Thank you for your time. We will return to this issue. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.